Now, folks, I was excited when I heard that this young man was going to be our keynote speaker. <laughs> you know, at 6.55 a.m., there's a segment that we play called Breakpoint. And that's when I first became aware of Eric McTaxis years ago. I was like, who is this guy? I love this guy. But I used to get him confused because him and John Stone Street sounded alike. I'm like, is it Eric or is it John? But I was excited and he's here tonight. Give him a hand as he come, Eric McTaxis! Thank you so much, wow. I've met, thank you so much, God bless you. Holy guacamole. I've never seen this many uh, conservatives in New England before. This is, uh, <laughs> some of you must be rhinos. I'm not, I'm not buying it, I'm not buying it. Um, it's a huge blessing to be here tonight and to hear the work uh, that the Family Institute of Connecticut is doing. You guys understand, Peter is a hero. You understand that? Yeah. And, uh, and let me just cut to the chase. Uh, at the end of tonight, you should write him a big check. Did you know that? Yeah, I hope that makes you uncomfortable. You should write him a big check, because if you're not helping him, you're not helping him. You understand that? This is amazing to me that in Connecticut, just this video, to hear the battles that you're going through. And it's a funny thing, these battles don't fight themselves. Someone has to fight the battles. And, and, and Peter and the family suit, they're fighting this battle. You know this for you, right? Everything goes to hell in a handbasket if Peter does not do what he does and if he's not funded to do what he does. And imagine if they had the money to do way more of what they're doing. I, I wanna be real clear that um, we all need to do more, right? Because we kind of leave it to some people to, to do it. We let people be, oh, he's outspoken, he's in that battle. We all, we all have to pitch in. If we all pitch in, it changes everything. This is the close of my speech. Uh, but I just started, so let me, uh, let me go back. Let me go back. Um, some of you know uh, that I'm a, a Connecticut native. Uh, I grew up in Danbury, Connecticut. Yeah. And we crushed all you guys in, uh, in sports. That's not true. Uh, I grew up in Danbury, Connecticut, uh, and um, I'm, I'm thrilled to say that uh, my brother, my nephew, and my 90-year-old mother are here at Table 17. Yeah. And uh, if you meet my mother, tell her she looks 84, because she, she'd really appreciate that. Um, but it's just so great to have my family here with me. Um, they're all, you know, I hope they don't mind my saying this, but they're all big uh, Kamala supporters. Yeah, it's really, it's, har it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Um, but what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? No, I'm, I'm, I'm so thrilled that I could joke about that, that that's not the case, and that they have, they have basic common sense. Um, I, uh, I, now keep in mind, I'm not endorsing a political candidate, right? You know, you could vote for Stalin or Satan. Well, we can't talk about that stuff here. Um, but it, it just, it thrills me to see this kind of turnout in Connecticut. And one of the reasons that I decided to speak tonight at a fraction of my normal fee uh, is because I love Connecticut and I care about what God is doing in, in Connecticut. And I mean, and I really, I really do mean that. And when I'm invited to speak in a blue state or in, in a place like this, it means everything to me. I'm gonna be there if I can be there because I know how tough it is. I, I can imagine what you all are going through here. I get invited all the time to speak in like Dallas and Florida and Phoenix and all these places. But I know that you guys are, you, you're really on fire. I mean, to be a conservative Christian and to believe what you believe in a place like this, it's just much harder. And so I wanna say God bless you for being faithful. Uh, it, it, it really is uh, vital that you do what you do. Now, uh, some of you know, um, I wrote a book called Letter to the American Church. I know that they had copies here. I guess they ran out of my, the, the sequel to that is called Religionless Christianity, which is just more of the same. But it all comes from my Bonhoeffer book. Now this is true, right? I, I never thought I would write a biography in my life. People think, oh, Eric, you write biographies. I never planned 
to write biographies. Uh, I thought I'd be a fiction writer. Some of you know I went to Yale University, which is a Marxist training ground down the street. Uh, it's, it's so funny because people think like I'm proud of going to Yale. I am, it is such a despicable place. Do you understand how spiritually dark Yale University is? It's, un it's unbelievable. Only outdone perhaps by Wesleyan. Um, but, but it's like a miracle uh, to go to a place like that and then to emerge and then somehow we know by the grace of God alone uh, to come to see things as they are and not as they would like us to see it. And it, it, that's kind of a, a, a microcosm of the battle we all face, right? We live in a world where the media would have you believe that half the people or more than half the people believe all the loony stuff that you know is not true. And you get, you get that impression because the cultural elites who have a lot of power, right? Um, they, they give you the impression that what no one really believes, lots of people believe. I mean, is there anybody who really believes that a rooster might be able to lay an egg? Does anybody believe that? We're being gaslit, obviously, in this world. And so I'm here to encourage you to say that most people know what's right and what's wrong. Most people in America know what's right and what's wrong, but we're often fooled into thinking that you're in the minority. You're, you're not in the minority. Um, and it's, that's, that's why it's very, very, very important for us to speak the truth. When you speak the truth, you encourage people around you uh, to speak the truth. But what I meant to say with the Bonhoeffer biography, now by the way, uh, the Bonhoeffer book uh, came out in 2010. Um, and why did I write that book? I wrote that book effectively because my mom, who is here, grew up in Nazi Germany. And when I heard from my friend Ed Tuttle about this guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer who's, who stood against the Nazis, who spoke up because of his faith in Jesus, spoke up for the Jews, I said, you gotta be kidding me. I could be interested in that kind of Christianity, okay? Because that's real. That, that's, that's somebody who's willing to live out his faith. Because if you're not willing to live out your faith, I don't think you really have faith. I think that the scripture is real clear. Faith without works is dead. And the American church has drifted to a place, the German church was in the same place in the early 30s, where they kind of act like, oh, it's all about faith. Uh, it's all about what I believe. And you know what? If it's real faith, yes. But God says if you have real faith, it will be manifested in how you live. And if you're not living self-sacrificially, if you're not living... Uh, as though you believe Jesus defeated death on the cross, then you don't really believe it. And that should scare us, right? Because it's important that we believe those things. And so the Bonhoeffer story really amazed me when I first heard about it, because I'd always asked, my mother grew up in Nazi Germany. My people were, were in this mess. And I know that just as there are many Americans today who aren't on board with whatever lunacy our administration is pushing, there were many Germans, many people in my family, they were not on board with what was being done in their name. And I wondered, how did it happen that a nation that was extraordinarily Christian, culturally Christian, um, that was extraordinarily sophisticated, uh, that in many ways is dramatically similar to where we are today, how did a nation like that slide down into the nightmare abyss that we all know about? We all know about it now, what happened. How did that happen? Uh, and so when I wrote the Bonhoeffer book, it was very personal to me because my mother and my family literally lived there when it happened. So anybody who's uh, tempted to think that it happened you know, a million years ago, you can talk to my mother, she's right there. She lived through it. She lost her father in the war. This is real. Uh, and I realized that we've somehow gotten this idea that it's, we, it's an outlier, we put it in a box someplace over there, we don't really take it seriously that it could happen here. And so when I wrote the Bonhoeffer book, I, I honestly had no idea that it would be received the way it was. Of all my books, it, 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 it was a, a genuine bestseller. It sold over a million copies. Uh, it was translated into 20 languages, and it will soon be translated back into English so that we can read it again. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, but I had no idea that that would happen. And I realized the reason 
that it, it, it was so compelling to so many people is because the story of Bonhoeffer is a compelling story. It's undeniable. It's not, it's not fiction. I didn't make it up, right? It's a real story. It's a true story. And I recommend it to you, not because I wrote it, but because he lived it. And when you read about the life of a real hero, it cannot help but inspire you to want to live like that. It cannot help but do that. And, and so I've written a number of biographies, but that one is the, is the signal one that, in a sense, people have come up to me for all these years. It came out in 2010, and so many people have said, the book changed my life. Now, I know it's not the book that changed their life. It's his life changed their lives. Because when you read about someone who lives what you know to be right and true, and you see it, you want to be like that. You can't help it. You're, you're made in the image of God. And you respond to that. Similarly, when you're surrounded by people who aren't living right, it, it really lures you uh, into not caring. And so the point is how you live affects other people. People are watching each of us. And so the Bonhoeffer story is the most dramatic example in a sense because he lived out his faith so remarkably, so beautifully, that it, it can't help but, but touch people. And so I really believe God called me to write that book prophetically because I could tell when I was writing it, and I'm not making this up, I knew that this was coming to us. Now that's an amazing thing to say, because I wrote the book in 2008, but I could sort of sense by the Spirit of God, and I don't say that kind of stuff lightly, that this is on our horizon. Um, well, here we are. There is no doubt that, that none of us dreamt five years ago that we could be here, that we could be facing genuine, uh, uh, th that we are in fact in a genuine existential crisis for the soul of America in a way that is palpable, there's no exaggeration, because you could have said this 10 years ago, 20 years ago, but it would not have been what it is now. What it is now, I mean, for example, you know that if we lose this election, it's over. Now, I'm not saying that to say, oh, it's the most important election. It is genuinely over. We're in an existential crisis. We've not been in an existential crisis since, since yes. Yeah. Now, the point, of course, is that if, if we are able to prevail in November, that's crossing the starting line. That's not the finish line, right? You, you, I think what we've learned is that it's not enough to elect a, a, a candidate or two. Uh, because we've been sliding for decades and decades and decades. It's up to the church ultimately to do God's work, but we need political uh, support. We need those people. So, so that's just part of it is, is the political thing. But, but the story of Bonhoeffer, as I say, I could sort of sense when I was writing it, this is coming to us. Uh, and, and so in, in a, the last few years, the reason I wrote a letter to the American church was because I could, say, I could see it's happening. Now, when I say it's happening, I want to be very clear. Uh, I say in the new book, Religionless Christianity, the sequel to Letter to the American Church, that we're in the third existential crisis of our history, right? So you have the revolution, you have the civil war, and you have where we are now. All the other struggles in our history have not been existential crises, right? The Spanish-American War, the Korean War, even World War II for America was not an existential crisis. We are in an existential crisis. We're at a point where the forces of atheistic, globalistic, Marxism, just to name three parts of this monster, uh, are arrayed against us uh, in a way that we could lose it forever, what we have. This is not just, oh, you lose an election, right? But the point is that much of the church is not fighting as though that's true. Now, I know many of you who are here are fighting as though that's true, but the reason I'm bringing this up and the reason I wrote a letter to the American church is because the parallel with what happened in Bonhoeffer's day is precisely that it was the church in Germany in the 30s that had the ability to stand against the evil of the Nazis. There's no doubt that the church in Germany had the cultural power to stand against the evil of the Nazis. And Bonhoeffer, a prophetic figure, tried to get them to stand against the evil of the Nazis. And we know that he failed. We know that he failed. 
And why didn't they stand? Well, they had religious excuses. What's more demonic than religious excuses for serving the devil? Well, I just want to be real clear. The reason I wrote Letter to the American Church is because the parallel to what happened then is, is that the same excuses have been given today by many, many pastors. And I would say, I would guess, that a number of you in this room go to churches that are looking the other way. A number of you in this room go to churches and God forbid tithe to churches that are looking the other way. And the hour right now is so late that I promise you, if you really understood how late the hour was, you would run from those churches. For the sake of your soul, you would run from those churches. Because to look the other way at a time when God is calling you to stand and fight is satanic. But the point is that the church acts like, well, we have a religious carve out. We just want to preach the gospel. We don't get involved in politics. So I say this because that's precisely what the German church did. I'll, I'll give you some figures. In 1933, as you know, Hitler took power, right? He was elected, right? He, he didn't, you know, he didn't, he didn't take power by force. He was elected by people deceived into thinking that he might be a good choice. They, they had no idea what they were doing. And I want to be real clear is that oftentimes we do terrible things out of simple ignorance. We, we don't do it because we're malevolent or because we want evil to rise. On the contrary, we just make mistakes. So people make mistakes and God is a, a, a gracious God. But in Germany in 1933, Hitler takes power and almost instantly begins to implement Nazi doctrine throughout the culture at lightning speed, lightning speed. And this is the thing, the Nazis had power and with lightning speed, they begin to take over the culture. But the tipping point for Bonhoeffer was that the Nazi attitude, and this is the attitude of anybody who believes, who believes in a big state, right? Whether it's Nazis, fascists, communists, anybody who doesn't believe what Americans believe, right? In the sanctity of the individual, in freedom, that we the people could govern ourselves, that we're free to govern ourselves, no one will govern us. Anybody who doesn't believe in that is ultimately at war with God and the people of God, because God and the people of God answer to a higher authority than the state. And so anyone who wants to take over a culture, to take over a society, will eventually go to war with the people of God, because the people of God will answer to God and not the state. Why, do the Chinese, why does the Chinese communist government persecute the Uyghur Muslims? It's not just Christians. Why do they persecute the Uyghur Muslims? In, a, in an evil, evil, evil way. Because the Uyghur Muslims believe in something beyond the Chinese communist government. And that is a threat to the Chinese communist government. So anytime you have fascists, communists, as I say, anybody who believes in the state as God, ultimately, they're eventually going to go to war with those who believe in some kind of actual God. That's just the way it is, whether it's the Jews or the serious Christians. So when, when Hitler took power, it was, of course, his job not to wake up the church to what he was doing, right? Isn't that, isn't that the goal? You're not, you're not stupid. Satan is an, it appears as an angel of light. He's not going to advertise, I'm evil, follow me. He's going to try to fool you into thinking he's good. And that's what the enemy does all the time. And so, I mean, right now, you're, you're seeing this in, a, in the political process. Lots of blather, lots of, of talking about like we're on the same page, we, you know, we want to close the border. Oh, right, right. Yeah, you want to you do all that good stuff. The point is that, that people who are interested in power, they're not interested in transparency and clarity. So Hitler knew that his goal is to take over the church, but he has to do it very quietly. He has to do it in such a way. The image that I always think of is Gulliver. In, in Gulliver's travels, you think of Gulliver being tied down by the Lilliputians, right? And, and how do they do it? He's sleeping. So if the church is sleeping, right, it's like Gulliver is being tied down by, you know, I don't know if it's dental uh, floss or whatever it is. It's something, it's, it's not very significant, but he's sleeping and the tiny Lilliputians, they're doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. If he wakes up at any moment, he can crush them. So they just want him to keep sleeping just a couple of more minutes because at some point, at some point, uh, it, it's not being done with twine. With, 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 uh, with the Nazis, it was being done with legislation, right? In our world, it's being done with legislation, rules. It's at some point, if the church wakes up, boom, it's 
too late. You can't move now. You're tied down. At some point, it's over. That is precisely what the Nazis knew, and it's precisely what Bonhoeffer knew. He was trying to wake up the church because he knew the window was closing. So 1933, Hitler takes over. They write the Barman Declaration. Some of you know the story. The Barman Declaration was those pastors that said, wait a minute, we need to take a stand. We need to write this declaration that makes it clear that a Christian's fidelity is to Jesus. It is not to the state. So we love the state, we're patriotic Germans, but at the end of the day, our fidelity is not to the Fuhrer, but to Jesus Christ. And they write this out and, and they, they clarify the whole thing. And there were about 18,000 Lutheran pastors in Germany at the time, and maybe five or 6,000 signed it. Kind of brave, right? You think, well, what about the others? Well, forget about the others for a minute. Of those five or 6,000, by the time you get to 1935, the Nazis had been so effective in bullying and canceling and threatening, they didn't need to use the FBI, they had the Gestapo. <laughs> they, uh, they did what they needed to do so that by the time you get to 1935, only 3,000 of the 18,000 were standing strong. This is the key. And Bonhoeffer knew that if only maybe 6,000 of the 18,000 were standing strong, they could have stood against the Nazis. But the Nazis bullied and bullied. So, so if you think about it, you have about 3,000 standing strong, saying, we believe what we claim to believe. We believe Jesus defeated death on the cross. We actually believe that, therefore we don't fear death. If you're a Christian who fears death, you're actually not a Christian. We're supposed to believe that God is so real that it's, it's not, it doesn't even require anything for me to be courageous. It's like idiotic for me not to be courageous, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm betting on a sure thing. And you find out what people really believe when things get tough. So Bonhoeffer could see what was going on in the church that the Nazis had fooled. Now again, it's, it's the same thing that's happening today. It, it's you have different reasons that people are being fooled or, or whatever it is. So of the 18,000 pastors, you had about 3,000 that were standing very, very firm heroes, being wi willing to be sent to a concentration camp, willing to lose whatever. On the other end of the spectrum, you had about 3,000 utterly pro-Nazi, 100% pro-Nazi. But here's the point. In the middle, you have about 12,000 who said, in effect, we're not going to choose. We're going to stay neutral. We're gonna sit on the fence. We just wanna preach the gospel. We just wanna preach the gospel. We just wanna do church. In other words, we're not gonna be political. R Romans 13, clear as a bell. We're not supposed to be political. We're supposed, whatever the state says, we're supposed to do it. I guess they never read the book of Esther. <laughs> they gave religious excuses for doing nothing in the face of satanic evil. And there's nothing more wicked, as I said, than giving a religious excuse for looking the other way as evil rises. And they said, no, no, we're gonna sit on the fence. We just, we just wanna preach the gospel. We just care about evangelism. There's a chapter in a letter of the American church called the idol of evangelism. What happens when you take a great thing and you make it an idol? You say, well, I'm not gonna talk about this or this or this or this because I might drive somebody away from Jesus. I don't know what thin-lipped, useless, evil, pseudo-gospel you're preaching in your church if you don't speak about these moral issues. But it happened in America. It happened in America in the 1850s. Do you know how many pastors in the 1850s said, oh, we're not gonna take a stand on the slavery issue. That's political. Oh, oh, no, we just care about doing church. We just care about singing hymns to Jesus. Jesus is disgusted with your hymn singing. Jesus is disgusted with your religiosity if you don't stand up against evil for the sake of the men and the women created in his image whom he loves. That's the job of the church of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Bonhoeffer knew this was the case and he tried to get the German churches to see this. But as I said, 12,000, it's almost like I give a pass to the 3,000 pro-Nazi Hitler lovers because they're just crazy. That, that's like, you've all seen videos on YouTube of you know, some woman pastor you know, talking about how abortion is a beautiful thing or what, like whatever lunacy, whatever. You almost wanna give them a pass because they're just crazy. But what about those pastors who, who don't think that way? 
but they are silent in the face of that evil. They say nothing. They say, we just want to preach the gospel. We don't want to be political in our church. That's no different than saying, I will not take a stand on the slavery issue because I care about the gospel. That has been happening. It's always the case. And, and I tell you, even pastors that I know and love say things like, well, from the pulpit, I, we would never endorse a candidate or we would never endorse a, 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 a party. And I think to myself, why not? Like, what do you fear? You have this thing called the Constitution. You have this thing called freedom of speech, freedom of religion. You can say anything you like. Are you, you care about losing your 501c3 status, I guess. Mr. Pastor, Mr. Brave Christian Leader, that's what you care about. Shame on you, because it is that kind of worldly uh, thinking that has allowed us to get to a place where uh, uh, Peter has to be fighting for the kind of crazy stuff that he's fighting for in America. It's the job of the church to be fighting these battles. It's the job of the church to be speaking this from pulpits. <laughs> so Bonhoeffer was, was trying and trying to get the pastors in the middle, the 12,000 pastors, but they said, no, 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 we just want to do church. You've heard the story, right, of, of the train passing uh, with, with, uh, with Jews going to Dachau or to some death camp, uh, and, and I, I don't know if it's an apocryphal story, probably it's an apocryphal story, but the point is that the idea that they say, no, 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 we just want to sing our hymns. We just want to sing our hymns. God is calling you to stand against evil. He's not interested in your hymn singing. He is not, he's disgusted by your hymn singing. By the way, Bonhoeffer actually said, uh, you know, those who do not speak out for the Jews should not sing Gregorian chants, should not sing worship to God. You speak up for the Jews. That's what God is calling you to do. And God is calling pastors today to do the same thing for the unborn, uh, for, for those. Th think, think if the church were to speak out boldly. Think how many families that don't go to church because they, they already know that most churches are useless. Most churches are not speaking to them where they live. It's all this piety and this religious stuff. What about the fact that my kid goes to school and is being propagandized into questioning his sexual identity? What about that? What about the back cat that my, my daughter goes to school and they have pornographic books in the library? What about the fact that my, my kids are, are in a public school where, where they're pushing socialist Marxist lunacy down their throats? The church should be speaking about that. The church should be actively speaking about that. And all of those parents who don't go to church suddenly would be interested in going to that church. And think of the irony, because a lot of pastors that don't talk about this stuff is because they're afraid that they're gonna drive people away. Well, they are driving people away. And, and I be really believe that the churches that refuse to speak on these things, it's no different than the fig tree that Jesus cursed. Jesus cursed the fig tree, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, cursed the fig tree. You have been unfruitful. You are cursed. That is what God is saying to the churches today that are not being fruitful. You are cursed. You're worried about losing people. You will lose everyone. Your doors will be shut. And doors are being shut. You know, I speak around the country, and so I have a, a knowledge. The churches that invite me to speak, almost all of them are booming because they have been bold on every one of the issues that the Family Institute of Connecticut is talking about. They've been bold from their pulpit. And if you're bold from your pulpit, people are interested in that kind of church. There are tons of people that when COVID happened and all the churches shut, they thought, oh, is there any churches that are open? I'll go to that church. They go to that church and suddenly they hear boldness. They hear courage. They go, you know what? I didn't know you could get this in church. I'm going to that church. Those churches have exploded. They're building new parking lots. I hear this all over the country. And the churches that are trying to cling to the few people, the few big tithers they have, are dying on the vine. This is God's design. This is God's judgment against churches that are not bearing the fruit that he commands us to bear. And that's where we are in America today. So the German church is an example to us, a nightmare example of what happens when enough people keep silent. So honestly, those 12,000 pastors said, we're not going to choose, we're just going to do church. We're not going to be political. We're just going to do church. We're just going to sit on the fence. We're going to be neutral. Well, they didn't know the devil owns the fence. The devil owns the fence. If you do not choose, you have chosen. Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God is a judge. You cannot fool him with your silence. 
So when you think about what is the state's idea of a church, what, what is the kind of church they let you go to in China, right? In China, there's the underground church. They're risking their lives and torture. But then they have the official state church. The official state church, the, the church, the state says, oh, you can go into that building on Sunday morning and do your little weird religious rituals. It has no bearing on us. We don't care. Uh, but when you come out, you will bow to the secular authority of the state. If you accept that, you've made a deal with the devil. The people who go to those kinds of churches that have made that deal, you've made, you're, it's not the church of Jesus Christ. I don't know what it is. It's a counterfeit church. And I, I wanna say there's an example in the, in the book, uh, the sequel to Letter to the American Church, I, and it's in my Bonhoeffer book as well, but the story I tell is, it's, the, it's like a made up thing, except it's a true story. Niemöller, Pastor Martin Niemöller, some of you know the famous story, he wrote the poem that, you know, first they came uh, for the socialists, but I didn't speak up because I was not a socialist. Then they came for this group, and I didn't speak up for that group because I was not part of that group. Then they came for the Jews, I didn't speak up because I was not a Jew. And then when they came for me, there was no one left to speak up for me. That's cancel culture in our time, right? They come for that group, and you go, well, I don't, I don't care about that group. And they come for this group, and I don't care about that group. Martin Niemöller was a, a patriotic German, and he was fooled by Hitler uh, into thinking, listen, uh, you know, maybe Hitler's not perfect, but he's not gonna come after the churches. He had a private meeting with Hitler. I write about this in the book. He had a private meeting with Hitler. He was a prominent pastor. Hitler gave him his personal assurance, I won't come after the church. I won't uh, have pogroms for the Jews. And Niemöller hears this and he says, okay, mein Fuhrer, you said it, I believe it. So Hitler comes into power and immediately starts taking the kinds of actions he said he wouldn't. Niemöller really believed, oh, it's the people around Hitler uh, if I can just have a meeting with Hitler, I'm sure I can convince uh, Hitler, you know, he just, ha he just isn't aware of what's happening. Well, it takes over a year for him to get a meeting with Hitler. So it's early 34, Martin Niemöller has a meeting with Hitler and in the meeting, uh, he's expecting that he's gonna be able to have a conversation, you know, with, with Hitler, that, that Hitler had a conversation with him before he gets elected. Now he's elected and he's in power and so he's gonna have a conversation. So in the conversation begins, with, uh, I believe it was Goering, reading a transcript of Martin Niemöller's tapped phone conversation. So just to kind of let you know, right, you walk into a room and they're like, okay, pastor, and they read his phone conversation that they had recorded where he had cracked some joke about Hitler or something benign, but the point, just to let him know, like, you're in trouble, pal. You're in trouble, so you better shut your mouth. No, you don't say one word. We can put you in a concentration camp now, right now just to give, put him on notice of who he's dealing with, right? So Martin Niemöller, of course, at that moment thinks, my goodness, and, he, and he, he starts, you know, standing up for himself. He says, well, mein Fuhrer, you don't understand, I'm a very patriotic German, which he was. He won the Iron Cross in World War I. Uh, he says, I'm very patriotic German. I care about the Third Reich. I care, I care about Germany. I care about the Third Reich. And Hitler says, and this is the, just to me the classic line, he says to him, I built the Third Reich. You just worry about your sermons. And he might as well have said little sermons. He might as well have said, you just worry about your useless little religious sermons. I built the Third Reich. In other words, the Nazis had a view, just as the Chinese communists do, just as the Marxist secularists in America do, that the church has nothing to say on any real issue. And that if you think you have a voice, they're not going to let you have a voice. They'll let, they'll let you think you have a voice until push comes to shove, right? And so they're not gonna advertise that they're gonna shut you down. Uh, if, if, if the dark forces win uh, in, in November, you, you have no idea what's going to be unleashed against pastors and people of faith in this country. It, it, J6 was just the beginning. And I say this as a warning to say, don't be fooled. Just as when the Nazis got power, they crushed the church, but they didn't advertise that that's what they were doing until they got the power. And once they got the power, they used it like crazy. So if, if the Germans had woken up, the German church had woken up before 1935, and that's where we are now in America, they would have had the ability to push back. But once the Nazis got power, they keep the church sleeping another minute, another minute. Don't talk about that, don't talk about that. So it, it actually happened. Uh, and, and so, Martin Niemöller, when he's having this conversation with Hitler, and Hitler says, you know, you just worry about your little sermons, that's the devil's idea of the church. You just do your little theological thing. Don't, don't, don't get out of your lane. Your lane is just to preach your little theology that has no bearing on anything. 
Well, here's God's view of the church. God's view of the church is that what you believe has bearing on everything. And Christians are supposed to live their faith in every sphere, not just on Sunday mornings, not just in some little theological bubble. You should be able to speak from the pulpit on every single issue. And if you love your congregation and you love the God that you claim to love, you will speak boldly God's point of view on everything concerning everyone with no fear because you're commanded to do that fearlessly. And so Bonhoeffer knew that is the church of Jesus Christ. So he was exhorting the church in Germany to be the church. And, the, and enough of them said, no, no, we don't want any trouble. We don't want any trouble. And so Niemöller in that meeting with Hitler suddenly saw the Nazis view of the church. It's an emasculated, defanged, declawed nothing. That's the devil's idea of the church. But I'm here to say some of you and your friends go to the devil's churches in Connecticut. Now, I know that's a harsh statement, but, you know, I, I just want to be clear. If you, if the German pastors who were being silent in 1934 knew what was coming, I guarantee you they would have not been silent. But they, they were convinced, how bad can it get? How bad can it get? The pendulum swings back and forth. I don't want any trouble. It's perfectly human to say, I don't want any trouble. But we're at a point where if from the pulpit and in your church you are not fighting in this battle, I'm sorry to say you're complicit with evil. You are unwittingly serving the devil's purposes. I don't have any illusion that pastors and Christians in Connecticut or anywhere are knowingly doing that. And that's why I'm saying what I'm saying, because I'm convinced that God wants us to know. God wants us to know how late the hour is. If you knew how late the hour was, you wouldn't be dithering anymore. I often talk to people and they say to me, you know, in the book line, they say, oh, I, I go to church and we're working on my pastor. And I'm thinking, I think the hour is, is too late. You're working on your pastor. We're not on a five-year plan. In five years, whatever you have will be taken from you. Your bullets, your money, your voice, whatever you have to fight the war of goodness and truth, th that it needs to be used now. And I'm not advocating use bullets. I mean the metaphor. If you're in a war and you say, well, I'm going to keep my powder dry. There's a moment not to keep your powder dry. There's a moment not to say, oh, I'm going to save this money for a rainy day. Because if you save that money for a rainy day, you don't give it to God's purposes like the check you're going to write tonight. Let me tell you something. In a few years from now, that money will be taken from you and you'll never be able to use it again. So it's now or never. Now, again, Perhaps I'm simply being histrionic, I'm being dramatic, or what I'm saying is true. I, I promise you, I wish before God that I were simply exaggerating, that I was just a hothead. But I wanna tell you, Bonhoeffer, he tried and tried and tried, and I'm not comparing myself to Bonhoeffer, but the principle is exactly the same, is that he said, I know that God's will is that the church would wake up before it's too late, the church would rise against this evil, and we know they did not. And we know that the death camps and the end of Germany, I mean, to this day, you know, Germany, there's no patriotism in Germany. They're still hanging their head 90 years after it happened. They're still hanging their head. And it was out of pure guilt that they let in like a million immigrants. Angela Merkel let in like a million immigrants. They're just still wringing their hands with guilt over what they allowed to happen because it actually happened. It's not like it almost happened, it happened. And we're there now in America. And so I really believe that what's happened in the last few years has been God's mercy, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to wake us up. So if you think of the lunacy, I have friends that were put in solitary confinement, friends of mine, because they were in the Capitol on J6. They went through living hell for doing absolutely nothing. This is at the hands of the government. Did it happen in Fidel Castro's Cuba? No. Did it happen in East Germany under the Stasi? No, it happened in the United States of America a couple of years ago. It's happening now. Some of you in this room have experienced some of this. It's happening now. A level of madness you never dreamt you'd see it in America. The, the, whole, uh, the whole trans stuff is, in, is insane. Everyone knows it's insane. I mean, if, if a man suddenly says, no, I'm actually a woman, th that's mental illness. Now, by the way, my heart breaks. I don't want to mock it. My heart breaks for someone like that. I was in the room 
a, a, a number of years ago when Bruce Jenner walked into the room. It's like Bigfoot in a dress, right? So like on the one hand, it's sort of funny. On the other hand, you want to cry. That how could somebody, but you have an establishment that's feeding these lies, that's saying, no, that's normal, no, that's good. Most Americans know it's madness. But the question is, will you speak against it? Will your church speak against it? Or are you going to say, well, I don't want to be the one to speak against it. I don't want to be the one to go to school board meeting and say there's porn in my kid's library. I don't want to be that one. Well, God is a judge, folks. And he died on the cross so that we would each be the one to use our voices. And when you use your voice, it affects people around you. When you don't use your voice, it affects people around you you when you know when we talk about male and female there's nothing more basic to the christian worldview it's like in the first couple of chapters of genesis it's not like some obscure you know interpretation that we all disagree we agree we get we're made in god's image male and female it's, it couldn't be simpler and most of the world knows this is true you don't need to be a born again jesus freak to believe that right most people in the world know that but God is looking to us to be vocal on that. God is looking to us to protect kids that are being bullied into transitioning, that are so confused. Imagine being in a state where the kid has been subjected to propaganda in the school. Your tax dollars are paying for the school. The parents are paying taxes to the school, and that school is brainwashing their kid away from them, away from reality. And then if they speak up, and it's happened, the state can take the child away. You understand the level of evil we're talking about? This is a new level of, this is utterly unprecedented. But again, the silver lining is I, I think God has allowed this to finally wake up the church. Will enough in the church wake up to these evils? And that's just one, we could mention so many. An open border, this is again, lunacy, right? Who doesn't know that not having a southern border isn't lunacy? I mean, everyone knows it's sheer madness and that bloodthirsty drug cartels are trafficking children. Can you take a moral stand from your pulpit on child rape? Are you willing to take a stand on child rape? Or do you say, oh, well, no, we want to have compassion on the foreigner. Some cliche while children are being trafficked and raped. If the church cannot speak out on these kinds of things, there are policies that are harming human beings. You're commanded in the scripture to love your neighbor. And God will judge us if we do not love our neighbors by speaking against these evils. He's given us a voice. He longs for us to stand and to be the church. Bonhoeffer says over and over that it's faith in action. And the German pastor said, no, 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 it's just theology. We're just gonna preach our gospel. You have to live out your faith. And then the question is, where are we now? Where are we now? Well, I guess I'll say this. If you went to George Washington in 1776, all right, so that's a, an existential crisis that we had, the, our first, we're in the third. And you said to George Washington in 1776, if you know the history, how, how are we doing? How's it going, George? How's it going? What would he say? He would say it's going extremely poorly. It was going extremely poorly, if you know the history, in 1776. But George Washington didn't say what many Christians would say, well, you know what, we're under God's judgment, so we're gonna sit on our hands and who gives a crap? <laughs> no, he, he didn't say that. There are many Christians who say, oh, we're under judgment, there's nothing we can do. Don't write a check, don't waste your time, don't get involved, don't do anything, we're under judgment. It sounds really pious, doesn't it? We're under judgment. Well, of course we're under judgment. But the point is, if you said to George Washington, how's it going, and he says it's going poorly, his, his answer would be, but we fight on. We fight and we pray. And we fight and we pray and we fight and we pray. And if it be the will of God to give us victory in this cause of liberty, if it be God's will, then we may prevail. It is our job to fight. It is our job to fight and to give God the ability uh, to, to have his will done. But if we do nothing, we are already deciding it's being done, it's, it's done, it's over. And there are many Christians in this country that very piously 
proclaimed, oh, it's already over. There's nothing we can done, do, do. Jesus is coming back in five minutes. I'm just gonna go to the root cellar with my water purification tablets and my Slim Jims. I'm gonna hang out. We're gonna be raptured in five minutes. Now, if you're doing that, if that's your theology, you're serving the devil. You're serving the devil with your pious theology that we don't need to fight. George Washington fought on and fought on and fought on. And because he did, I don't know if you know how it turned out, but <laughs> every single one of us could be the tipping point. This is what, when we talk about what is the church, the church is those of us who dare to say, I believe in Jesus, I'm gonna live for Jesus, I'm gonna put my faith in action. You, using your voice, you could be the tipping point. You could be the one who inspires someone else to live differently, who inspires someone else to live differently. I hear stories, folks, and we're not gonna find out till we get to get heaven how it worked out, but some of you are examples of that. Someone maybe shared their faith with you. Maybe they, they, they might not have, but they did. Changed your whole stinking life, didn't it? It changed your whole life life. The man who shared Jesus with me, Ed Tuttle, he's, he can't uh, be here tonight. He's having a hair treatment, I think. But <laughs> he shared his faith. It changed my whole life. When you just do what God calls you to do, you have no idea what the ramifications might be. You have no idea. You may never know. You may never know. I visited um, with, with David Berkowitz in prison in upstate New York. He was the son of Sam serial killer who Jesus reached and changed dramatically. He is such a man of God. It makes you want to weep at the picture of redemption. But when I was sitting with him, I thought to myself, how did this happen? And he tells me that he was still in Attica prison. This is 1988, I think. He's in Attica prison and some prisoner in the yard keeps talking to him about Jesus. And at some point, he finally cracks Jesus comes into his life, and that prisoner disappears, goes to another prison. He's never been able to track him down. That one guy changed David Berkowitz's life. David Berkowitz ministers to thousands of people over the decades, thousands of people. He's corresponding with changes. Of that. What, what you, I'm not just talking about sharing your faith, you understand. I'm talking about whatever you say or do can have ramifications because it is God using you. You have no idea. I, when I wrote letters to the American church, I thought, I don't know, is anybody gonna read this? And if they read it, are they gonna do anything about it? I have no idea. If somebody tells me that I gave this book to my pastor, my pastor has changed the way he preaches, and now he's on board, he's, he's in the fight, you don't need everyone to do that. You need a few more. And so tonight I'm here to say, we just need a few more. And what you say or do might lead to just a few more that might be the tipping point. We don't need every American uh, to be in this battle, but God wants his people to be in the battle. And if enough of his people are in the battle, it's not gonna be everybody, it's never gonna be everybody. You know that in the revolution there was like maybe 3,000, I'm sorry, maybe 3% uh, who were involved? 3%, we all have our freedoms because of the 3%. No thanks to the 97 that did nothing or sided, they were Tories, they sided with King George. 3%. So what if we'd only had 2%? We might have lost, right? What percentage do we have in America today? What do we need? What is God's will? I'm here to tell you, I believe it is the Lord's will that we would avert disaster, that we would get back on track, that we would redeem this nation and the culture. I believe it's the Lord's will. I know the Lord called me to write this book. I, I, I know that that is God's will but the lord you know he does a strange thing he creates us in his image and then he gives us the opportunity to do whatever we want he doesn't force us to do the right thing he didn't force the german church to do the right thing and they went into the abyss of hell and you saw that that's history it happened but it's not the lord's will it's the lord's will that just enough of us would wake up that just enough of us would say i'm in and if the lord be with me we might win. And I, I honestly think that if enough of us will get in the fight, would put our shoulder to the wheel, if enough of us would do it and would stop saying it's over, there's nothing we can do, isn't it terrible? 
but would say, if it's the Lord's will, we might win, then I honestly believe we won't just avert disaster. We won't just avert enslavement under a Marxist, globalist, atheist tyranny. We won't just avert that, but we will have a new birth of freedom in America. I believe that Lincoln's words were prophetic, that we are to have a new birth of freedom and we will see God's hand in our history in a way that most of us cannot even dream of. I believe that's the Lord's will and that it's the Lord's will that his people be the ones to do it. As America goes, so goes the whole world. And as the American church goes, so goes America. And you are the church, and every single one of you has the decision, am I all in, utterly self-sacrificially for God's purposes? And I'm here to tell you, not only is that the right choice, that's the beautiful choice, that's the choice Jesus is cheering you to do the right thing because he wants you to be a part of that victory. He doesn't want you to miss out. Church, be the church and see what the Lord your God will do. God bless you. Give it up again for Erica Texas. Wow. The kid from Danbury. Come on up, Peter.